Hello everybody, welcome back to another episode of Side Projects. In this one, these things should have remained side projects that have, should never have been constructed because we're talking about the four worst aircraft in history. Let's go. In many respects, the world's worst aircraft, like their infamous four-wheeled counterparts on the previous video, biggest flops in automotive history, which you should definitely check out if you enjoyed this video, or cars, or our videos in general. Thank you. Like Cadillac Cimarron's Edsels and Chevy EV1s with wings, they're among the worst flying machines for a variety of reasons, including lousy design, atrocious safety records, and entirely too much marketing hype that far exceeded the aircraft's action abilities. In those examples, I'd definitely be like, I'd rather it be overmarketed than unsafe. It's a plane. It could crash, and you could die horribly. The Blackburn Rock was one of those rare flying machines that was already obsolete when it first took to the air, in this case, back in late 1938. The ungainly, let's be honest, pretty goddamn ugly rock was developed based on specifications from the Royal Navy for a two-seat fleet defense fighter bomber capable of operating from aircraft carriers. But though the design met the Royal Navy specs, the resulting aircraft was heavy, underpowered, and about as aerodynamic as a dump truck. But despite faulty planning, poor design, and abysmal performance, the ROC did feature a few innovative features, the most prominent of which was the large machine gun turret protruding from the fuselage behind the cockpit. In the years leading up to World War II, turret fighters were all the rage in England, but despite its abundant drawbacks, research and development went full speed ahead and production got underway in less than a year. The idea was that a manned turret bristling with four Browning through three machine guns that were capable of firing in a wide field around the aircraft would easily be able to fend off faster and more agile adversaries and therefore make it more likely that both machine and crew would survive in combat. However, with a gutless 815 horsepower Bristol Perseus 12 engine, 8,000 pound maximum takeoff weight and a top speed of just 220 miles per hour, attainable only when using short bursts of emergency power, the rock's pitiful cruising speed of just 135 miles per hour made it easy pickings despite its defensive machine guns, which themselves were largely responsible for its woes due to the added weight and enormous drag. Though it was no fighter, the rock was a competent dive bomber capable of descending on its targets from angles approaching 70 degrees, but it was often said tongue-in-cheek that it could barely catch even the slowest naval vessels, and in reality, the only aircraft it could outpace were the slowest German seaplanes, typically relegated to maritime reconnaissance duties. Rocks were fitted with universal carrier racks under each wing, which could accommodate a wide range of munitions, including 30 and 50 pound incendiary and 100 and 200 50 pound high explosive bombs, but with a total ordnance capacity of less than a thousand pounds, that's 453 kilograms, it was far from a heavy hitter. Though its lack of aerodynamics, weight, and meager power plant usually got the blame for its shortcomings, the rock's propeller certainly didn't help either. During early testing, the diameter was increased by nearly three inches on each blade to enable the prop to move more air, which at least theoretically increased both top speed and climb rate, but the resulting loss of engine RPMs made the lumbering rock even slower than it would have been otherwise. Other drawbacks included a lack of wing mounted machine guns that were standard on other fighters, interceptors, and dive bombers of the era, and a relatively narrow undercarriage which made the rock unstable during carrier landings in strong crosswinds. In the end, how an aircraft barely able to attain 200 miles per hour in an era of Fokker Wolf 190s and ME262s was expected to survive in combat is honestly just anyone's guess. On the bright side, though just 136 units were produced, one rock did have the distinction of shooting down a German Ju-88, one of the world's fastest bombers. There's no word on whether the crew survived, but if they did, they must have had a heck of a time explaining this to the Luftwaffe brass. Built as a cutting-edge all-purpose aircraft capable of propelling Western Air Forces into the future, the F-104 Starfighter was an expensive, overhyped dud with an abominable safety record that included nearly 300 accident losses and more than 100 deaths. In fact, it's no wonder that the German pilots who flew 104s referred to them as widowmakers, and US Air Force aviators weren't thrilled with theirs either. Dubbed the missile with the man inside, the Buck Rogers-esque plane featured stubby, razor-sharp wings, a long fuselage with a pointy nose, and a monstrous General Electric J-79 afterburning turbojet that delivered nearly 16,000 pounds of thrust, enough to push the machine to 1,450 miles per hour, or Mach 2.2. First taken to the air in the early 1960s, it looked the part of a slick new fighter, but its flashy exterior hid 
a myriad of design flaws. Designed by Kelly Johnson's crew at Lockheed's famous Skunk Works of U-2 and SR-71 Blackbird fame, the plane was meant to serve in reconnaissance, fighter, interceptor, bomber, and ground attack roles. Unfortunately, its wings were so short and narrow that they couldn't carry fuel, guns, or landing gear components, all of which had to be stuffed into the fuselage around the hocking engine. Ironically, however, it was the wings, along with a powerful engine, that allowed the plane to achieve the blistering speeds and impressive climb rates for which it was most well known. But without multiple drop tanks, 104 said paltry ranges, and even worse, their turn performance was absolutely atrocious. A huge drawback for a frontline combat aircraft that might meet much more maneuverable enemy aircraft like MiG-21s in the skies over Europe. In addition, F-104's initial radar package wasn't particularly powerful, which made it suitable only as a daytime and clear weather fighter slash interceptor. With a 20mm Vulcan rotary cannon, heat-seeking missiles, and a 4,000 pounds, that's 1,850 kilogram bomb load, it was potent, but its deficiencies dwarfed its attributes. But though the USAF quietly pushed the unwanted plane to the proverbial sidelines well before it was originally slated to be retired, it was hawked relentlessly to foreign countries like Italy, Turkey, and West Germany. West Germany alone was the not-so-proud recipient of more than 900 examples, most of which were upgraded versions capable of operating in inclement weather as interceptors and ground attack aircraft, though at 2,000 pounds heavier than the American version with no corresponding increase in power, it wasn't particularly well suited to either role. Especially when engaged in ground attack, the aircraft needed to quickly respond to pilot inputs, like when the ground was approaching at 400 miles per hour. And the reality is the plane just couldn't do this very well, again, largely thanks to the small surface area of its wings. Deep insult upon injury, it was discovered that Lockheed executives had bribed German officials into purchasing the F-104 when it obviously wasn't what they needed. But the scandal was swept under the rug after telling procurement documents were mysteriously destroyed. Nearly immediately after introduction in the early 1960s, aircraft losses and deaths began piling up both stateside and in Europe. In the case of West Germany, many pilots had been trained at Luke Air Force Base in sunny Arizona, but they had serious trouble taking what they'd learned back to their home country, where cold, wet weather was common. Now, that's not normally a big deal, but with the F-104, such meteorological trivialities were often the difference between life and death in an unmaneuverable plane with exceedingly high stall, approach, and landing speeds, yet again, thanks to the tiny tiny wings. Statistics show that in West Germany alone, between one and two dozen starfighters crashed every single year between 1968 and 1972, and even after significant safety modifications were made, losses continued at a rate of about 10 annually until the aircraft was finally phased out in the late 1980s. Determined to make the most of their investment, Italy flew the 104s until 2004, despite losing nearly a third of its fleet to crashes in the previous decades. Designed by the Mikoyan Guyevich Design Bureau in the early 1960s, the MiG-23 was the Soviet Union's premier third-generation fighter when it entered service in 1970. Meant to combat the new breed of big, multi-role American fighter bombers like the F-4 Phantom and the F-111, like the latter, it featured variable geometry wings, which optimized performance at nearly any speed and altitude. But like in the F-111 and the later F-14 Tomcat, the revolutionary swing wings, which were capable of sweeping between 16 and 72 degrees, created at least as many problems as they solved. Despite that, the aircraft, NATO codenamed Flogger, was large, powerful, and blisteringly fast, thanks to its slippery lines and Tomansky R29-300 jet engine that produced more than 27,000 pounds of thrust, which could propel the 40,000 pound machine past Mach 2.4 or to nearly 1,900 miles per hour. But while the Flogger was impressive in some areas, British and American pilots and intelligence officers tasked with evaluating it determined that it wasn't all that it cracked up to be. First, it was much larger, heavier, and more expensive than its predecessor, the MiG-21 Fishbed. It was also difficult and costly to maintain, it sucked down fuel at an alarming rate, and sported an engine that needed to be changed out after just a few hundred hours of flying time, which required the entire fuselage to be disassembled into two pieces first. In addition, its engine was more suitable as an interceptor rather than a dogfighter because under high G-loads, extreme torque could cause the compressor shaft to bend and the turbine blades to fly into the intake, destroying the engine instantly. In fact, the MiG-23 was such a colossal letdown to export 
customers around the world that many nations who bought them opted to keep their old MiG 21s in service instead of using these new birds. Though it was definitely egg on the face of the Soviets who touted the plane as a new wonder weapon comparable to anything in the West, they made the most of the situation by selling new engines, spare parts, and technical services for hard currency, which they desperately needed. On the positive side, it was the first Soviet fighter to field a look down, shoot down radar and one of the first to be armed with beyond visual range guided missiles. Production started in 1969 and eventually topped 5,000 aircraft built, making it the most produced variable sweep wing aircraft in history. Today, the MiG 23 remains in limited service with some less developed countries, though since the early 1980s it has fared poorly in skirmishes with comparable Western aircraft like American Air Force flown by the Israeli Air Force over Syria and Lebanon. Though the estimates may be politically motivated and therefore skewed, it's claimed that in actual combat MiG 23s were usually on the losing side of kill ratios that were often as lopsided as 10 to 1. Now they're usually left in hangars or pressed into service in ground attack roles when there's little likelihood of them running into newer fighters. Despite its often fatal door problems that tended to make the headlines, the McDonnell Douglas DC-10 has actually got a lot going for it. This attractive jet sported three powerful turbofan engines, could transport nearly 280 passengers, had a maximum takeoff weight approaching 600,000 pounds, that's 272,000 kilograms, and fully fueled, it could travel more than 3,500 miles, which made it a good choice for long-haul intercontinental flights. Not surprisingly, when it was introduced in the mid-70s, orders poured in from all over the world, and when all was said and done, nearly 400 units were built. That's in the annals of contemporary commercial aviation history, the DC-10 claims one of the worst safety records of all time, as evidenced by a 1974 Turkish Airlines crash that killed nearly 350 passengers and crew just after taking off from Paris, and a 1979 disaster that killed more than 270 in Chicago. And there were more. Many more. The DC-10's main problem was that, unlike its competitors, it was equipped with doors that opened outward instead of inward. Though it might seem like a trivial matter, inward opening doors had been standard equipment on airliners for decades, and for good reason. They're very safe. On the downside, inward opening or plug doors ate up valuable space that could be used for passengers and cargo, and in an uber competitive industry like commercial aviation, pinching a few pennies on each flight could pay huge dividends in the long run. Originally, the DC-10's design incorporated plug doors, but in response to a last-minute request from one of its biggest customers, American Airlines, MD changed to a new outward-opening door system that not only freed up interior space, but had the added advantage of shaving nearly 30 pounds, that's 13.6 kilograms, of excess weight. But unfortunately for those who would fly on DC-10s, the new doors weren't tested adequately under real-world conditions, and they were ultimately responsible for a number of catastrophic crashes or as they're referred to in aviation lingo, loss of hull accidents. Though it's believed that no FAA rules and regulations were actually broken during testing, it highlighted a number of areas in which safety took a back seat to politics and convenience, and as a result, hundreds of lives were lost. In fact, many claims that there existed between big manufacturers like McDonnell Douglas and regulators and all too cozy atmosphere, though it evaporated quickly when planes started falling from the sky and everyone started pointing accusatory fingers at everyone else. This was certainly the case after an incident on June 12, 1972, in which a DC en route from Detroit, Michigan to Buffalo, New York, lost a door over Windsor, Ontario, Canada. Though the incident wasn't fatal, it highlighted serious flaws in the aircraft years before the aforementioned fatal crashes, yet the FAA dropped the ball purportedly after things were smoothed over on a phone call between the agency's top official and the president of McDonnell Douglas. All told, DC-10s were involved in more than 50 accidents and incidents and suffered 32 hull-loss accidents, crashes that resulted in the deaths of more than 1,200 people. So I really hope you found that video interesting. If you did, please do hit that thumbs up button below. Don't forget to subscribe, and as always, thank you for watching.